So regarding the homework and the grading, important, important announcement. So for the, the grading, we've decided that the exam is going to be 50% of the grade and one problem from the homework, just one problem, is going to be the other 50% and the reason for that is I think it gives you a chance to try two different things. The grade doesn't just depend on the exam. I'll tell you which problem during the tutorial and you have the whole weekend and to try and solve the problem yourself. If it doesn't work, then I'll sit with you and with the TAs and I'll make sure that everybody here has solved that problem, right? So I'm just giving you 50% of the grade right now. Yeah, so you should be happy with that. Yeah, so. Okay. Okay, okay, so don't get too excited. Okay, so uh, don't worry about the size of the, the writing here. This is just mainly for my notes, but it's, it's for me to at least go over what we discussed in the morning. We finished a lot of stuff in the morning, right? So we finally, we first started with the idea that in traditional chemistry, you have a chemical and chemical synthesized with some rate F, it's degraded with some rate G, and in stochastic, in stochastic uh, chemical kinetics, these Fs and Gs take on a different interpretation. Instead of saying the chemical X is created at rate F and degraded at rate G, you have to say in your mind, molecule X, which can take on discrete values, is created with probability F dt and is degraded with probability G dt in a time interval dt, right? So it's very important that the difference between F and G is correctly respected. It's not just F minus G that matters. We then took that description and we realized that therefore F and G represent Poisson processes and F and G are propensities for events in those Poisson processes. Uh, we wrote down this thing, which is called the master equation. It's not named after somebody named master. The first paper where this kind of thing was used, this was the equation from which they derived everything else, so it was called the master equation. Yeah. We took that equation and then we did a Taylor expansion of the equation. We cheated a little bit. We Taylor expanded where the small number was one, right? F of i, f of plus or minus, i plus or minus one. And so we took this equation. These terms canceled with the first terms in the expansion of this. We expanded to second order. We ignored all the rest of it. And therefore we get this equation, which is called the Fokker-Planck equation. The Fokker-Planck equation looks because it is like a diffusion equation, right? So now we went from this variable, which is, remember, the number of cells that had exactly I copies of that molecule. That's how I motivated this whole equation. But you can also think of it as the probability that a cell has I copies of the molecule, right? or, or the probability that the system is in a state where there are I copies of the molecule. Um, we then moved over to thinking about P as a continuous function of its variable, and some people were uncomfortable with differentiating by i, because i is an integer, so I put it back as x. Yeah, so don't, it's, these i's and x's are the same thing, discrete and continuous. So we now have partial p with respect to t, and on the right side we have two terms. The first term is a drift term, that's why it has a minus sign there, and the second term is a diffusion term. If you've ever derived the diffusion equation using fixed laws of diffusion, you realize that the thing inside this partial represents a flux. So all this term does is it moves the probability as a whole. So this is x, this is t. So if you start off with some value of x, then this term is the deterministic part, right? It moves up by an amount f minus g delta t in a time step delta t. That's this part. This part is the diffusion part. It's the part that's random and at least as a conditional probability distribution starting at x1 at time t1 and ending up at x2 at time t2, you will have some sort of distribution like so, right? The diffusion part is the part that makes that happen, right? And the sigma over there will go as square root of delta t. In fact, it has exactly the value Sigma squared is exactly the value f plus g delta t, okay? So that's uh, this equation. This equation captures the idea that there's a deterministic piece and there's a stochastic piece, which is the new piece for chemical kinetics. We also tried to capture this kind of intuition using a different notation. 
people are comfortable writing down ordinary differential equations, right? So we can write down a form where we say dx dt is some f minus g, like the traditional equation, but we have to add a noise term. Now this noise term is, remember, it's the derivative of one of these curves, right? It's a derivative of a squiggly jiggly curve. In fact, it's the sum of delta functions. It's not a very well behaved quantity, okay? Um, what we did was we integrated this equation for some amount of time delta t and therefore got a difference equation for x and you're able to use this difference equation to predict where x is going to be after some time delta t, yeah, which is given like so. It's the first piece which works just like ordinary calculus, delta x is f minus g delta t plus the second piece which captures the idea that you're going to introduce some noise. This is a Gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance one, but it needs to be multiplied by a prefactor. This prefactor is in fact, just like over there, it's f plus g delta t under the square root sign. Okay, because that's the square of the variance, that's the variance and this is the, the linear part of it, okay? So this is a recipe for simulating the process. It's a very simple recipe. Start at some x and then add some delta x depending on your delta t, some small delta t, 0 0.001, right? Some delta t, times f minus g, you add that part to the original x and then you add a random component and that'll get you where you are, yeah? And then you do it again and again and again and thereby you simulate a stochastic trajectory, right? And by doing this over sufficiently large numbers of delta t, you're going to have a fairly decent approximation for the final conditional distribution of where you end up given where you started. If the system happens to reach an equilibrium, then after sufficient time, that final distribution will be independent of where you started and it's called the steady state distribution of the system. Okay, uh, fine. Yes, this is Ito, this is Ito. So this recipe uh, is actually independent of thinking of whether it's Ito or not. If you want to make sense of an equation like this, you have to say it's Ito, right? So what I've been trying to tell people is, you know, this kind of equation, I don't mind if you ignore it because it has to do with a lot of subtleties of how you integrate this stochastic noise term, right? This is just for the people who are interested, okay? Uh, fine. So now I'm going to tell you one, so this, how many ways have I shown you how to think about this? I've shown you one way, the master equation, which is like a, a, it's linear in its dynamical variable. The dynamical variables are the heights of all these bars, right? That's the dynamical variable. How many dynamical variables are there? Infinitely many. They're all coupled because the pi plus one and the pi minus one coupled to the equation for pi, but it's linear. So you can write the whole thing as a matrix and formally you can just exponentiate the matrix to find the solution. So in some sense, the master equation is a very well behaved thing. This is an approximation and those of you who like solving PDEs, you can use all the tricks you want to solve this PDE. Um, and like I said, this, this is called a Langevin equation. And this can be solved with the use of this random number generator, okay? So I'm going to teach you one more way to solve this system, okay, which has to do with the following thing. Um, imagine I draw a random number which is R and this random, or let's call it U. U is uniform in zero to one. So I just draw u and then I make a transformation and I say the variable, well, uh, do I want to call it t? Okay, the variable theta is one over u natural log of one, oh sorry, one over alpha natural log of one over u. Okay, so far I'm not explaining why I'm doing all this stuff. So I've taken a uniform number. This is a uniform random number between zero and one, right? So one over u will be a number that goes from one to infinity, yeah? Log of one over u, therefore, will go from zero to infinity. And one over alpha log of one over u will just be the same thing but compressed a little bit, right? Now, it turns out that the distribution of theta, right? The probability density of getting theta is exactly this, yeah? P of theta is exactly alpha e to the minus alpha theta d theta, okay? And the way to check this is your standard, this is the same trick. You use a cumulative probability distribution, 
to convert a uniform random number into a non-uniform random number. Right? That's all I've done. We discussed this on the first day. It's a way to convert a simple variable u into a variable theta that has a different distribution. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So this is important because this distribution is exactly the distribution of waiting times between successive events of a Poisson process. Yeah? So this gives me a very visceral, a very uh, tangible way to draw a variable of interest, a random variable of interest in the simulation of a stochastic process. And now I'm going to show you how to implement such a uh, simulation. Okay. So what's going to happen? We're looking at the time axis. We start off at some time. And at that point in time, there's some x of t equals 0 amount of stuff in the system. Okay? And now what do we want to do? We want to see when the next event happens. And how many kinds of events are there? In the very simple equation that I wrote down here, there's only two types of events. There's the creation of x and there's the removal of x. Yeah? In principle, you can do the same thing if you have a large number of chemical species. Each one of them will then have a creation event or a degradation event that could possibly happen. Yeah? Each one of those processes, each one of the things that could possibly happen has some propensity, some probability per unit time. The F's and the G's. Okay? And those F's and G's are the things that go over here. It's 1 over F log 1 over U. Or 1 over G log 1 over U. 1 over F of the 15th reaction log 1 over U. And each of these U's are obviously independent random numbers. Okay? So what do I want to do? Assuming for this very simple case, there's only two things that can happen. I'm going to draw two numbers. I'm going to draw one number from this distribution. And that tells me that the next creation event will probably happen at some, at some time t plus. And I'm going to draw another random number which says that some degradation event is going to happen at some time t minus. Okay? And if there were many chemical species, I would draw many different random numbers and label which chemical they're all talking about. Okay, chemical 5, chemical 15, and so on. Um, remember what I told you. Because this is chemistry, there's no way to exit the left side of this curve, right? So if you already have zero molecules, the propensity to lose a molecule is zero. In other words, G is zero if X is zero. If that's the case, then this time will be infinite. So if you already have no molecules, then the next time you're going to lose a molecule is infinitely far away. You never have to worry about it. Okay. So here we go. And in general, if there were many chemicals, then with different colors maybe, I could have T plus and T minus of some other chemical. Right? I have T plus and T minus of a blue chemical. And I have T plus and T minus of a green chemical. And so on. Okay. Is, is the setup clear? So well, how many times have I used the random number? I've used it the number of chemicals times 2 because each chemical could either be created or destroyed. Cool. Now, here's the key. Between this point and this point, what happens? Nothing. Right? The system hasn't changed. And because the system hasn't changed and it's a memoryless process, all these statistics are still perfectly valid. Okay? Nothing changed in the underlying rules. Therefore, what I can do is immediately jump to the earliest of all these random times that I wrote down. Right? In this case, there are six possible times when something could have happened. I go to the earliest one. There it is. And I say, well, let me look at this and say, what happened? In this case, chemical 3 was removed by 1. Right? So then we have to say x3 goes to x3 minus 1. And you just update the state of your system from wherever it was at t equals 0 to wherever it is now. Okay? Then what do you do? Well, then, you know, you have drawn all these random numbers, but I'm sorry, all bets are off now, as they say. Right? Because the number of x's has changed. So in principle, the propensities of the other <coughs> processes have changed. Right? So you have to remove all those other guys. You say, too bad. And I regenerate the next set of t pluses and t minuses. Right? If I find these colored chalks again. Yeah? And again, 
Nothing is happening between here and here. So I go to the next closest one, which is right there. And then I say, in this case, x2, which is green, goes to x2 minus 1. Okay, and I keep going. So is this process clear? It's a very simple way to simulate stochastic processes. There is another way to do it, which is in every little interval, you could draw a random number to see does something happen or not according to these rules. Yeah, but then most of the time, nothing is going to happen because it's a rare event. If you've chosen your delta t sufficiently small, most of the time, nothing is going to happen. So this little trick enables you to jump straight to the final event. Okay, fine. A few subtle points here. If I'm starting here and I could only have a single event, let's say x is zero, so it can't get destroyed. Let's say there's no other x's in the system. Mm -hmm. There's no other x2, x, x3, x4, there's only x1. And x1 is being created at a rate alpha. Right, then I draw a random number whose average is going to be like one over alpha. And I go straight to it, right? Now here's a little question. Suppose there are two x's, x1 and x2. And let's assume for the moment that they're both being created independently at numerically the same rate, alpha. So I draw a random number for the chance that x1 is created, and let's call that t1. So there are two, two species, x1 and x2. And for the moment, the propensity for creating x1 is alpha, and the propensity for creating x2 is alpha. So the time to the creation of the first one, t1 plus, is some one over alpha log one over u, one. And the time for creating the other guy is some one over alpha log one over u, two. Yeah? So we know that the average of this is going to be one over alpha, right? Because this has exactly the form of this distribution whose mean value is one over alpha. Alpha is a rate, so one over alpha is a time. The units all work out. The mean value of t2 is going to be one over alpha. But which one of these are you going to pick? You're going to pick the minimum one. Right? You're going to pick the first one that you hit. So, simple question. What is the expectation value of this? What is the expectation value of that? I draw two random numbers according to a distribution. I draw two random numbers according to a distribution and I pick their minimum. And now I want to know how big that time is going to be. Right? So, that it's going to be smaller than 1 over alpha, right? because the chance that at least one of them is sort of small is sort of high. So how small is this going to be? What is the expectation value if there are two events and you're waiting for the first one of those to happen? Right? So of course, you know, you can actually solve it, right? You're going to solve a joint distribution of T1 and T2 and over here T2 is less than T1 and over here T1 is less than T2 and from this, you can project the minimum. And you know the joint probability distribution, some sort of exponential. Right? And you're trying to work out the distribution of the minimum. But you can go and do that. You can go work that out. And this will be some sort of two-dimensional integral with appropriate limits on the integral sign. But I want you guys to just think very, very intuitively. I draw two random numbers. And I take the minimum, what's going to be the expectation value of the map. Just, just look at it. Is everybody clear that the expectation value of one random number is going to be one over alpha? Yeah, because it has this probability distribution. The mean of this probability distribution is one over alpha. So in this case, I have two of them. Any, any guesses at least? Any guesses? Okay, the answer is actually staggeringly simple. It's one over two alpha. 1 over 2 alpha, right? In fact, it's even more interesting than that, right? If I draw a bunch of random numbers, theta 1 is 1 over alpha 1 log 1 over u. Theta 2 is 1 over alpha 2 log 1 over u, and so on and so forth. And I look at the minimum of theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, yeah? then the expectation value of that is actually 1 over alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 plus, right? In fact, it's even better than that, 
right, the distribution of this variable, theta bar, right, the full distribution of that variable is simply alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus e to the minus alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus tau d tau or theta d theta. Okay? I'm saying something quite interesting. I'm saying something quite Usually, if you look at the distribution of the minimum of two distributions, that is, the distribution of the minimum of two random variables drawn from their own distributions, right? The answer is some ridiculous thing to calculate. If the individual variables are drawn from this exponential distribution, right, then the answer is very simple. The minimum itself is exponentially distributed. Can somebody give me an intuitive reason for this? What's the reason for this? If you think of it correctly, this is actually quite simple. Yes? Yes, in a way. Okay, Neil, yes? Well, it's not because they're independent. You know, if I just give you a standard uh, collection of, you know, let me ask you a simpler question. Suppose all these were uniform distributions, and I took the minimum of n uniform distributions. What distribution would that have? It's not a uniform distribution, right? So these distributions don't behave themselves under this kind of transformation. It'll be some crazy thing. Yeah? So the reason this works out so well is because it arose, remember, from a process. Remember how we calculated the distribution of waiting times. I said some event happened and some other event happened. And in the intervening period, the chance that nothing happens is 1 minus alpha dt. And the chance that something happens is alpha dt. Right? That's how we derive this waiting time distribution. Now, suppose I added other processes. Suppose I added other processes, right? Which is essentially what this is. I'm adding many, many processes. And I'm taking the waiting time to the first one. Yeah? If you didn't have color vision, all these would just look like white arrows. And what you have in the end is just a single Poisson process with the total propensity, which is just the sum of all the individual propensities. Yeah? And therefore, the waiting time for the first event right, is just like the original one, except that the total propensities are all added together. Okay? So, so this is quite interesting, right? Um, Okay, are there any questions about this? So, there is an algorithm called the Gillespie algorithm. Okay, let me see. Which is an exact stochastic simulator, which actually uses this idea. In, and I don't know why it's, uh, it's better to do than the thing I'm saying. The thing I'm saying is, for me, very straightforward. Write down all the reactions that could happen. Just draw a random time where you think all of them are going to happen, and just take the minimum. Yeah? Instead, the Gillespie algorithm uses fewer random numbers because in 1976, random numbers were sort of expensive. They aren't anymore. So the Gillespie algorithm, all it does is calculate the waiting time for anything to happen, right? Which is given by a sort of pseudo-reaction where you would add up all the propensities of all the sub-reactions. And once you decide when anything is going to happen, after that you have to decide which thing happened. And which thing happens just happens in proportion to its own rate its own propensity. Yeah? So if you're going to read about the Gillespie algorithm, you'll find that it's phrased in that way. First, find out when anything happens, and secondly, find out which thing happens. I don't find that to be a particularly interesting way to look at things. I prefer that you look at things my way, which is you write down all the creation and destruction events that could happen. You write down all the rates or propensities associated with each of them, all the Fs and Gs. You write down all the random times where they could happen according to this distribution. Yep. And then just pick the minimum. And once you pick the minimum, you know which row you're talking about. And that row corresponds to, say, molecule 15 is destroyed. You, you take x15 and you make it x15 minus 1 and you start the whole process again. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So in your uh, homework, the problem that is graded, you're going to have to implement this thing. It's called a Gillespie algorithm. It's very straightforward. It's, in fact, the most straightforward way 
it's essentially a Markov chain update of the stochastic system. Okay. So let me add that here, Gillespie. 1 over alpha log 1 over u is the little thing you have to keep in mind, right? If you remember this, that's how you get the next waiting time. If you remember that, everything else is easy. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, let me erase this and keep going. So right now then, I've given you four different ways. I've given you four completely different ways to interpret this thing. One is a linear cascade of equations. The second is a partial differential equation which you can solve using standard methods. The third one is in fact a collection of random updates that looks like an ordinary differential equation integrated numerically with this little random component. And the fourth one is the Gillespie algorithm. The best way to do it, in my opinion, is the fourth way, right? The Gillespie algorithm is exact. It gives you the exact answer limited only by the precision of your uniform random number generator. Yeah? It never fails. Okay. Any, any questions? Fine. Now, suppose I'm not interested in generating an entire stochastic trajectory. But suppose I'm interested, for whatever reason, on looking at the steady state distribution for some system. Okay? Suppose I am. I could be then you don't have to go through many of these steps. You might actually be able to derive the steady state directly. Let me show you how for a couple of cases. So case number one, mRNA synthesis. S I S, right? So remember I told you yesterday you have a gene and the gene gets translated to this molecule which is called messenger RNA. And the way this happens, you know, is reasonably complicated. There's a machine called RNA polymerase, which binds to the upstream element of the gene. And once it's triggered, it moves across the gene, it takes about a minute to do it. And once it's done, it threads out the RNA, which gets released in the environment, okay? So what I'm going to keep track of is the moment the RNA molecule is actually released. And I'm going to count that as mRNA goes to mRNA plus one, right? M is equal to M plus one. Uh, okay. Now what happens to the messenger RNA? The RNA floats around, but with some probability per unit time, another protein, which is called a restriction endonuclease, it doesn't matter, comes and chews up the RNA. But another protein, which they usually draw as little Pac-Man, comes and chews up the RNA. And that happens with some rate gamma. Let's say this is some rate alpha. Okay? So let's write down a few equations. First of all, the equation if the RNA was not being created at all, but it was only being degraded, I have n RNAs in the system. Each one has a probability per unit time gamma of getting degraded, and therefore the whole thing looks just like radioactive decay. So you get D, in this case M DT, is minus gamma M. That's this piece, right? Because this gamma is a rate constant that has to be multiplied by how many M RNAs already are in the system. Right? So in this case, this is G. G is gamma times N. Yeah? And what is F? F is just alpha. Okay? Very, very simple. Looks almost too simple. And if you were to plot as a function of M, either F or G, this is what G looks like. This is what F looks like. Right? And they intersect at a value M star is equal to F of alpha over gamma. Any questions? Okay, so the standard chemical kinetic description of this whole process, this is the central process that determines how genes are expressed in every cell on the planet, in your body as well. And it's actually a fairly good description of how it happens. Yeah. Uh, and I'll expand on it later, but the point is now, what do we expect from this? We expect that if the creation rate is constant, then the system will reach a steady state number of mRNA where the creation and the degradation rates equalize. If you are very far to the right here, then the degradation rate is much higher, so you lose mRNA molecules. If you're very far to the left, then the synthesis rate is much higher, so you'll gain mRNA molecules. So this is actually a stable fixed point. 
It's actually a stable fixed point. At the end of this class, we're going to look at a system that is multi-stable or bistable. So it'll have many stable fixed points and many unstable separatrices separating. Okay, so this is, this is the equation, right? Um, okay, so now I want to try and solve for the full chemical kinetic version of this, the full stochastic description of the same thing, right? And I can do that. It's just this equation, right? So it's d dt p that has a certain number m is equal to i, right? Well, let's call that m also, right? Is equal to minus, so f plus g is alpha, f minus, f plus g is alpha plus gamma m, p m plus alpha p m minus 1 plus gamma m plus 1 p m plus 1. So just stare at this equation for a second and see how it corresponds to the general case that we derived earlier. The general case has these two terms which are the variables that add to this bin, these two terms, sorry, that take away from this bin, these two terms are the variables that add to this bin. F plus G is alpha plus gamma M. F I minus one is alpha because alpha is independent of I. And G I plus one is gamma times M plus one because it's coming from a higher mRNA number, P M plus one. Questions? Okay. So how would I solve for the steady state of this? Any guesses? Okay, let's set the left hand side to be zero. Then what happens? You get a recursion. How do you solve the recursion? So the recursion involves three steps, right? So of course one thing you could do is you could set P of zero and you could set P of one and then solve all the others. That's one way. But there might be an easier way to do it. Okay, so well let's let's work out the equation, right? So what do you get? You get minus uh, are there enough terms here? Yeah, sure. So you get alpha P of M minus um, plus gamma M P of M plus alpha P of M minus 1 plus gamma M plus 1. I'm just writing the whole thing out and then I'm going to move things around. Equals 0. So now I want to move things around so that things look like a reasonable recursion. So can anybody suggest a good way to do this? How should I move things around to get a reasonable recursion? The second term should be a negative sign. Oh, thank you. Okay, so how do I move things around to get a reasonable recursion? We could even use machine learning, but I'm saying there's a much easier way. Just look at it, yeah. Yes, there's one index minus one. Yes, exactly. So there's there are minus ones. Okay, so the reason this is not a very nice recursion is because it mixes three different levels, right? Usual recursion, usual recursion just mixes one level with the next level. So all we need to do is to convert this, massage it into a way that converts one level to the next level. So let's just see. You get minus alpha P of M, right? Plus, let's say, gamma, uh, alpha P of M plus, let's say, gamma M plus one, P of M plus one on this side, and that's equal to minus alpha p m minus one. Sorry if you can't see this, I'll write it again later, right? Plus gamma m p of m, okay? Sorry if you can't see this, but what it says here is that this term, that this function h of m, which is alpha p of m, plus gamma m plus one p m plus one. It says that that function has the property that h of m is equal to h of m minus one. Yeah, I just, I mean, you just have to solve it this way, right? It's, there's, no, there's no insight to be gained here. Now you have a very nice recursion, right? Because if h of m is equal to h of m minus one, then the whole thing, must be equal to h of zero, okay? And if you realize what these terms are actually saying, right, remember what they're saying. 
0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, right? This term is gamma times 1 p of 1, right? And this term is gamma times 2 times p of 2, right? This term is just alpha times p of 0. This term is alpha times p of 1. Right, so what is this H? This H is just the net flux. It's the net flux moving between these two things. So it's the difference of the two, right? Maybe up to a minus sign, right? So the H is negative means your alpha is high, right? So H is the net flux moving in the left direction. So what is the value of H here? Zero, right? Since you can't cross the left boundary, H must be zero. In other words, just evaluate it for the zero term. There's nothing coming here, right? And there's certainly nothing going back. So that means that all these are equal to zero. And that's how we managed to convert a three-step recursion relation from a two-step recursion relation to a simple solution to steady state. Right? If this thing is equal to zero, then we know that alpha pm is equal to gamma m plus one pm plus one. Right? So let's just work it out completely. Right? So alpha p zero is equal to gamma times 1 times P1. Alpha P1 is equal to gamma times 2 uh, P2, right, and so on. In fact, I can work the other way. Uh, alpha P3 is equal to gamma times 3 P3, right? So if I start from P3 and work my way backwards, uh, sorry, alpha P2, question? Yeah, so then I just have to work my way backwards. So let's, in fact, do that very explicitly. So that means P2 is equal to, well, which way do I want to go? Let me go upwards. Let me go upwards. P1 is equal to alpha over gamma P0. P2 is equal to alpha over gamma squared times half times P0. P3 is equal to alpha over gamma cubed times one-sixth P0, and so on. Right? I'm just reading it off. So does that look familiar? Right? That means, in general, P of M is equal to alpha over gamma to the M P0, 1 over m factorial. Yeah, I'm just, just going through the math, right? This should look familiar because it's just the Poisson distribution. Right? It's just the Poisson distribution. How do I find the value of P0? I know that the sum from i is equal to 0 or m is equal to 0 to infinity, P sub m must be equal to 1. And therefore, P of 0 is e to the minus alpha over gamma because this is an expansion for the exponential. So at the end of the day, what we have in steady state, in steady state is 1 over m factor is alpha over gamma to the m over m factorial e to the minus alpha over gamma. So this is interesting. This is actually very interesting because it's unexpected. This distribution happens to have the same mathematical form as this distribution, yeah? But it's derived in a completely different way. It's derived through a series of, you know, recursion relations, zero steady state, flux, all kinds of stuff, work the ladder up. Okay, so this puzzled me for years. Why is it that this Poisson distribution, remember how we derived this, or how I failed to derive it in the morning, but nevertheless. This Poisson distribution is just the limit of the binomial distribution. Right? It can be derived using high school methods. Is this Poisson distribution the limit of some kind of binomial distribution? Right? It's not. It's some other crazy thing. Right? But whenever you see the same mathematical form appear in two different places, you might want to tease apart why that happened. Yeah? Um, 
So it turns out the reason this is happening is pretty fascinating. And I won't prove it to you now, but you can read a paper I've written about it. What if, I mean, so remember, here, the assumption is that the mRNA is being chewed up by this Pac-Man protein, and the chewing up process is happening with a constant probability per unit time, right? So if you look at the mRNA lifetime, tau mRNA, how long will this mRNA survive before it gets chewed up, right? The, the expectation value for this, for a single mRNA molecule, is in fact one over gamma. And the lifetime distribution of mRNA is exponential with value 1 over gamma on average. Yeah? So this equation turns out to be exactly correct if you substitute alpha times tau mRNA Where tau mRNA in this case is a very simple thing. So this is, sorry, expectation value. And let me try and explain this to you. Let me try and explain this to you, and then you can see if this is surprising or not. Okay? What is actually going on here? Suppose I started my system at some time in the past. And here, I'm looking in the present at t equals 0. Okay? And suppose mRNAs are being created at these various times. Those are all the random times when mRNAs are being created. Now, that's a Poisson process, right? Because it has a propensity of alpha. So the average waiting time between these will be like 1 over alpha. And we expect that the number of waiting time events in a time interval t should be alpha times t with a variation which is a Poisson distribution, which is what this is. Now, this seems to measure, what is this actually measuring? This is measuring the number of waiting time events in a time interval which is exactly the length of the mRNA lifetime on average. Okay, so why would that be? So let me explain why. For the moment, suspend what I told you about the way mRNA is killed. Suppose, you know, it could happen, in fact it probably does, that as soon as an mRNA is created, every mRNA in the cell survives for exactly 10 minutes and then is degraded. Suppose that's the case, right? Then is the system Markov anymore? It's not, because you have to know how long the mRNA has been alive. You can't just count how many mRNAs there are. So this is a very different kind of stochastic process than the one I sh showed you. Right? But let's just humor me for a second. This mRNA, as soon as it's born, survives for a fixed time. Right? This mRNA, as soon as it's born, survives for the same fixed time. This one 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 survives for the same fixed time. Right? These are all just... And these days, you can literally look in a cell in a microscope and watch these kinds of events happen. Okay? So let me ask, if I'm observing at t equals 0, which mRNAs do I care about? It's only these three. None of the others, right? Okay? So that means these might as well have not even been created. Yeah? So what is, which is the window in which I would possibly catch an mRNA? Zero till minus mRNA lifetime. In this case, the mRNA lifetime is exact, so expectation value of that is nothing, right? So only these. So if the mRNA was created during a time window of size this guy, then I would see it today. And I know exactly how many mRNAs are created in that time window because it's a Poisson process. And the answer is a Poisson distribution. So a Poisson distribution on this axis becomes a Poisson distribution on that axis. Okay, and that's why you get this equation. Now it turns out, and this is really fascinating, it turns out that even if the mRNA lifetime 
is some arbitrarily complicated thing, right? As long as it has finite mean, it doesn't matter how complicated it is, right? It can even be changing with time. As long as it has finite mean, this equation is still valid, okay? So this is a, an interesting little piece of history about the gene expression literature. When people first measured the distribution of mRNAs in single cells, and this happened in the early 2000s, when they first measured that, they found that the distribution of mRNA was really a Poisson distribution. And they immediately then said, this proves that mRNA synthesis and decay are themselves Poisson Markovian processes, right? In fact, that deduction is not valid because even for a highly non-Markovian, highly complicated mRNA decay process, you get exactly the same steady state distribution, okay? So this is very interesting and the proof of that, I leave you to read uh, a paper of mine uh, I forget, written three years ago. It's called Universal Poisson Statistics of mRNAs. It's in Biophysical Journal. Maybe I'll email it to you and you can, you can read it. Okay, fine. Any, any questions about this? Okay. So, let's keep going. So what's the mean of this? The mean value of M is alpha over gamma and the variance of M is also alpha over gamma because we know it's a Poisson distribution. So indeed, the mean value is alpha over gamma, right, which is kind of neat, okay? So let me step back a little bit and now ask, under, you know, standard chemical kinetics, yes? It doesn't due to integration by parts. You can read, re read the paper. I don't want to get into it now. Okay, it just goes through. It's beautiful. Does somebody want to know how? I mean, I'll catch me later, catch me over, you know, some free time and I'll, I'll, I'll derive this for you, okay? This is taking me slightly as aside. Okay, so one important matter, right? Suppose I measured the steady state, suppose I measured the steady state mRNA distribution. Suppose I measure the steady state mRNA distribution in single cells, right? One of the things we know is that it's centered around M star, which is alpha over gamma. We also know it has the shape of the Poisson distribution, yeah? So one interesting thing to ask is what is the relative spread of this, right? So we know that delta M squared square root over M is equal to one over root alpha over gamma, right? Is equal to one over root M, right? Which goes to zero as M goes to infinity, yeah? So, so there's a sense in which standard chemistry is recovered in the limit of large numbers because all your distributions in relative proportion collapse around their deterministic expected value, okay? Now this statement is true not just for the steady state but in a sense for other time points in the distribution as long as the history has been erased and as long as that time point also involves high numbers, right? So in other words, everything they taught you in chemistry with these kinds of equations is not wrong, mostly, right? It's wrong, it fails in certain pathological cases, but mostly these equations in a sense capture most of what's going on because most of the distribution is centered around the deterministic value you would have expected. And that centering is very, very narrow, not just centered around, but just bunched around them. So that's the first way in which the deterministic law emerges, right? They call this the emergence of the deterministic law. Emergence of the deterministic law, okay? So that's the first way. But in cases of interest in cell biology, you're never in this large number limit. limit. So in those cases, in what sense does the deterministic law emerge is a reasonable question. So now I'm going to show you another way the same thing happens. So for now, let's not go to steady state, right? Let's just take this equation absolutely seriously, right? And just ask what happens 
what happens to the expectation value of m as a function of time. Okay? If I ran this system again and again and again and again, right? If I start off with let's say m is equal to 0 at t equal 0 and I ran it, I get something. I run it again, I get something else. I run it again, I get something else, right? And after doing this experiment many, many times, I take the expectation value at all times. And the question is, what does that blue curve look like? Right, so any ideas on how we can understand just that blue curve from this equation? Remember, this is an infinite stack of equations. That blue curve is just one variable as a function of time. Yeah, just multiply it out, right? So what do we want? M is, in fact, sum of M P M from M is equal to 0 to infinity. Yeah? Is that fine? In fact, if I can just abuse the notation a little bit, it's not an abuse. It's, in fact, the sum from M is equal to minus infinity to infinity. Okay. Because P of M for M is equal to minus 1 and all negative numbers is 0. So I haven't added anything to this. Okay. So I need to know what happens to that sum. Okay, so I'm going to multiply this equation by that quantity. Let me erase this. Right? So I'm going to multiply that equation by this quantity. Help me out here because I'm very close to the board, but let, let me see how it goes. So you get DDT sum, and I'm just going to drop the limits of the sum. It's minus infinity to infinity. M P of M. Right, is equal to minus, uh, let's do all the pieces separately, alpha sum m p of m minus gamma sum of m squared p of m because there's already an m here and I'm multiplying by m again. Okay, <laughs> Then you get plus alpha, I'm going to run out of space, so let me hope for the best. You get plus alpha m. times sum of m p minus 1. m times p of m minus 1, not p minus 1, but p of m minus 1, right? And the last piece, which is plus gamma and the sum m, m plus 1, p, m plus 1. Okay? So far, so good. This is all completely correct and accurate. So this kind of thing, hint, is going to be a question in your exam. Now your exam is going to contain a very simple extension or a reduction of this problem. Your exam involves working out what happens when alpha is equal to zero and you just have gamma. So when alpha is equal to zero and you just have gamma, it's just radioactive decay. And you're going to have to do tricks like this to work out the answer. Okay, it's very simple. So now, this is not very nice. This is not very nice because I know what this is. This is just expectation value of M. I don't really know what that is. Well, it's the expectation value of m squared, but okay. And I don't know what to do with these two things. So what should I do? If you've seen this before, it's fine. If you haven't seen this before, I want somebody who's not seen this before to try and tell me what to do. Yeah. You haven't seen it before. Very good. So the, the, the problem I'm trying to articulate is when you write down these master equations, this, this is the variable that we are trying to calculate the behavior of. Yeah? It's written down as a certain sum. It's a very simple sum. I recognize that sum here, but I don't recognize it anywhere else. So the goal, can we get a closed form equation for just this guy? So how do I massage the right side of the equation to contain other terms that look just like this guy? Change. Yeah, change. Into dummy, dummy variables, right? So this is in fact equal to alpha sum of m plus 1 pm, right? I just increased the dummy index by 1. Since the limit goes from minus infinity to infinity, it doesn't matter. This is just equal to gamma times sum of m, m minus 1 pm, okay? So now I'm in good shape. It turns out then what I have is I get ddt of expectation value of m, which is this guy, is equal to, well, this minus alpha m p m cancels with this. 
yeah this gamma m squared pm cancels with uh, well m yeah cancels with one of these terms right this is m squared minus m so this gamma m squared pm cancels with this guy and the only thing you're left with is in fact alpha sum of pm right M minus gamma sum of m pm right and if you stare at that for a millisecond you'll realize this is equal to 1 because the system is normalized and this is equal to m right so let's write the whole thing then d m d t is alpha minus gamma m right we went through a lot of circus to get this very simple result right here i wrote dm dt is alpha minus gamma m and here i have dm dt is alpha minus gamma m but i've taken you through a long arc this is a sort of guarantee this is a guarantee that if you're interested only in the expectation value it's going to fit your original equation but this doesn't always work it only works if these terms are linear in m okay Alpha is linear in M trivially, gamma M is linear in M. Yeah? So if all the terms of your equation are linear in the state, right, then the expectation value will obey the deterministic law. Okay? That's an interesting thing. Secondly, you can actually work out what happens to all the other moments. Yeah? Now there's no guarantee that the other moments have closed form equations like this. In general, the equation for higher moments require knowledge of all higher moments. It's only in very special cases, right, that you can write down closed form equations for the moments of the distribution, even though you have the entire equation sitting right in front of you. Okay. Any, any questions? So I, I, I find this to be quite nice because this is another sense in which the deterministic law has emerged from the underlying stochastic chemical kinetic process. It's another reason why your chemistry teachers didn't lie to you. They just didn't tell you they were taking an average. Right. Okay. Um, fine. Let's keep going. Let's erase it. A couple more things to do before I wrap up. Can I erase it? Can I erase it? Okay. You'll need to use this trick for your exam. Right? In the exam, you're going to have to do the same thing, except you're going to put an M squared. And you're going to have to do all these cancellations and see what happens. Giving you the answer, guys. I'm giving you the answer. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to now talk about a very important uh, test case for this kind of modeling approach because it has been applied to a real system, it's been applied to a real genetic system in bacterial cells and human cells and various other kinds and it stood the test of time. This is the idea of a bistable switch. Okay, the bistable switch or a flip-flop, two-state system, you can call it many, many things. Except this one is made out of genes. So in order to understand this, I'm going to develop the model a little bit. I'm going to derive the, I'm going to derive the deterministic equation for you. And your graded homework problem is working out the stochastic consequences of the same thing. Okay. So the bistable switch is, you know, it's, it's interesting. It has the following property. If this is x, then this is f of x, and this is g of x, right? And wherever f of x is equal to g of x, you have a deterministic steady state. Creation balances degradation, right? There are three points, for example, where this happens. Now, if you look at this zone all the way to the right, their degradation is higher than synthesis. g is higher than f. Therefore, you're going to move to the left, right? But in this intermediate zone, synthesis is higher than degradation, so you're going to move to the right. In this zone, degradation is higher than synthesis, you're going to move to the left. And maybe there's a tiny little zone here where you move to the right. So this is a stable point. This is a stable point. 
This is an unstable part. Yeah? How many of you have seen this kind of thing before? Okay. How many of you have not seen this kind of thing before? Enough people? Okay. So I, I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about it. So there could be a parameter that controls the shape of this F curve. And depending on the values of the parameters, there's a lot of things that can happen to it, right? So, for example, I can develop a series of curves that have the following property, right? Initially, the curve intersects only once, right? Maybe it gets a little closer. Maybe then just as tangential. Then it crosses three times. It becomes tangential again. And finally, it has, yeah? So this is just, I'm saying that F depends on some unknown parameters, uh, kappa. Well, kappa looks too much like X. Uh, phi. Right? F depends on some unknown parameter phi. And as I increase phi, as I increase phi, the system goes from having one stable fixed point, one stable fixed point, and one critical point, two stable fixed points, and one unstable, one stable and one critical, and one stable fixed point. Another way to write this down, remember this is x, right? right? Another way to write this down is to write as a function of phi, as a function of phi, what are the values of x, which are the stable points? And you notice here, there's just one low value of x, right? For theta, for theta values of five values of one, two, three, four, five, six. At value one, there's only one value of x. At value two, there's only one value of x. At value three, it's interesting, this value of x is here, but a new one has just emerged. Then you have four, where there are three values. Then you have five, where there's only one value down here, and there's one up here. <laughs> Then you have six. You have six where there's only one value up here. Okay? Now, it looks a little odd, but if you stare at it, trust me, this is the curve you're going to get. Okay? This is just the solution to the equation f minus g is zero as a function of phi. That equation, in general, it's a nonlinear equation. It can have multiple roots. These are its multiple roots. This traces the path of the unstable fixed point, and these two trace the paths of the stable fixed points, right? This is called a saddle node bifurcation. This is called a saddle node bifurcation. In this intermediate zone of phi, the system is bistable. In these zones, it's called monostable. Sometimes this is called a low fixed point. This is a low slash high. This is a high fixed point, low and high to measure the amount of the value x that there is in the system. Okay? Now I'm going to do one of those rotations again, right? So here I'm putting phi on the x-axis, and I'm putting x on the y-axis. Yeah. One of these curves. And the deterministic expectation is if you start off with some value of phi like so, you're all going to be sitting over here. And as you move the value of phi down, you stay up here because you don't have any reason to access that fixed point, and then there's a catastrophe. Boom, you stay up here, stay down here. Moving in the other direction, you stay down all the way till here. There's a catastrophe, you move up, right? And this is called hysteresis. It's called hysteresis, okay? Um, another way to think about the same thing is you can actually think about a sort of energy well representation right? where you might want to say dx dt. Ah, this is where I'm going to kill myself for using phi, so let me not use phi. Somebody give me a letter quickly. I can't think of any letters. What letter have we not used? Q. Okay, let Q be the control parameter. Yeah. Oh, we've used Q. Some, give me some other letter. I'm totally... V, we've used V, we've used U. C. The English letter C. Okay, fine. No problem. Yeah, control parameter C. Yeah, very good. So you might want to write down an equation of this type. dx dt is minus d phi dx, right? So what is this? This is the behavior of a system in a potential well. 
right? But in a highly viscous medium. It's a behavior of a non-inertial system in a potential web. Yeah? So in other words, it's just a ball rolling down a hill in a highly viscous medium. It has no inertia, so it's not going to flop around at the bottom of the hill. The potential wells that correspond to all these states, in this case, the potential well has a well on the low side and nothing on the high side. Here it has a well on the low side and something is starting to happen on the high side. Well on the low side, it becomes flat. Now it has two wells. This well goes away and one well and then you have only one well, right? The, these points where the wells exist are the stable states of the system. These points where the peaks exist are the unstable states, right? So the unstable state corresponds to the peak of a well. So I can even draw that green thing. If I could draw many, many of these, trace them through, you will find a sort of thing like this. Right? So the deterministic steady states can be thought of as the troughs of a well and the unstable fixed point that separates them can be thought of as the peak of a well. And if a ball starts off on the peak, it's going to fall either to the right or the left. But if it's in one of these troughs, it has no reason to jump over to the other side. This is the deterministic case, right? It's called a two-state system, uh, bistable, uh, double well potential. I mean, it has many, many names. Okay? Fine. So, and hysteresis happens because once you're stuck in a well, there's no force in the deterministic world that's going to push you over to the other side unless you have an external control parameter. Okay? So, fine. Let's see how to treat this. Let's see how to treat this using this representation. So what I'm going to do now is move to a, st the same way that I solved the steady state of the master equation, I'm going to solve the steady state of the Fokker-Planck equation for F and G. Yeah. So let's do it the usual way. So if I'm solving for steady state, then I get minus D dx F minus G P, that term minus half D dx F plus G P, that term is equal to zero. Yes? A little larger, yes. I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't want to erase anything. This is my problem. I wish this board was many times larger. Uh, let me try. <coughs> let me try, okay. So I have, if I set that term to zero, I have minus D dx F minus G P minus one half D dx F plus G P is equal to zero, right? I've just set this Fokker-Planck equation to zero in the same way that I had set the master equation to zero. So far, it's the same move, yeah? But I've deliberately taken the partial in, inside the bracket, okay? Because I want you guys to interpret it as this is the derivative of a flux. So when you do fixed laws of diffusion, this is the flux J that's moving through the system, right? And we already knew from the master equation idea that the flux must be zero, the net flux must be zero because there's no guys exiting or entering from the left side, right? So this thing itself must be zero, must be zero, right? So then you get the following thing, you get F minus G P of X is equal to half D dx F plus G P of X. Uh, now what do you do, right? Painful, painful. So by the way, these partials are now redundant because it's just a function of x because time has now gone to infinity. You're in steady state. I'm going to define this thing as a new variable q of x. Right, so therefore the left-hand side becomes f minus g over f plus g p of x is equal to one half, oh sorry, Q of X, F minus G over F plus, uh, yeah, Q of X is equal to one half D dx F plus G, oh, just Q. 
Have I missed any minus signs? I think not. Okay, let's hope for the best. I hope this Q doesn't look like a phi. Okay, how do you solve this thing? Rather trivially, because you get on the left side 2 f minus g over f plus g. And on the right side, you get d dx, the natural log of q. Because moving this to that side, you get a logarithmic derivative. Cool? Any questions? And, yeah? So, uh, what was the reason I was setting it to be 0? And oh, what's the reason to set the flux to 0? Remember h was 0 earlier? h was the, the difference of cells passing left and right. Yeah. And you can't cross the left boundary at 0. You can't go below 0 molecules, right? But that matches the flux from 1 to 0 because everything is in steady state. Okay. Yeah? There are many kinds of steady states, but this is a zero flux steady state. Right? It's, it's also like what you knew about detailed balance, right? Everything balances exactly. Okay. Um, it's a zero flux steady state, but not for the detailed balance reason. It's a zero flux steady state because it's chemistry and you can't cross to negative numbers. Okay. So this is easy. How do you solve this? You integrate it, right? So you get something like Q of X is something like the integral or e to the integral of 2 f minus g over f plus g, right, dx. And p is just that over f plus g. So p of x is equal to 1 over f plus g times this thing. Okay, so let me, in fact, I can get rid of this and let me write that down. In steady state, for the bistable system, in fact, let all this go away. For the bistable switch, in steady state, you have, not even for the bistable switch, for any kind of f and g, right, you have p of x is equal to 1 over f plus g right, times e to the integral 2f minus g over f plus g dx, right. Now, I want you to stare at this briefly. You might ask what the limits of the integral are, right. Think of it as an indefinite integral. The indefinite integral brings a constant up here. The constant is used to normalize this equation. Yeah, so you can derive the constant by saying the integral of p uh, is equal to 1, and that will give you the correct limits of this. Yeah? So don't, don't worry about the constant. If you worry about the constant, I'm just going to put it this here, E. Okay, so this is a correctly normalized probability distribution. It's a normalized probability distribution that depends on certain things. Right? Um, okay. Now, remember, how do I get this potential well? What is the actual value of phi that gives me curves that look like this? Right? If ddx is minus, if dx dt is minus d phi dx, right, then phi must be equal to minus the integral of f minus g dx. Yeah, that's how you get a potential. If phi is minus this, then d phi dx is just f minus g, and minus d phi d, with a minus sign, and minus d phi dx is f minus g itself. Right? So this is correct. So here, this guy looks a bit like phi looks like a potential, right? So I can even write a minus sign. I can even write a minus sign and put minus over here. Two minuses. Okay? So this looks like some e to the minus phi. Okay? Not phi of x. It looks like some, yeah. So it looks like some e to the minus phi, phi of x, but, okay. So it's starting to look a bit like your well-known I'm very familiar with Boltzmann distribution. Okay, but where's the temperature? The temperature is obviously coming from this term, F plus G. Now, I'm not saying this is exact. It looks like a potential term and this other piece, right? So let me try and make this analogy a bit more exact. And I'm going to do it for a very specific case, which I erased. This is why I hate erasing stuff. But I'm going to do it for the case of D X D T is alpha minus gamma x. <coughs> For this simple case, f of x 
is alpha, and g of x is gamma. Right? And for this simple case, we know that f looks like this, and g looks like that. Okay? And I know that the system is probably going to be spending all its time around here, because that's the steady state. Right? And in that zone, let's look what f minus g and f plus g look like. Right? In that, around that value of x star, around that value of x star, x star is alpha over gamma, around the value of x star, f is equal to alpha, because it's always equal to alpha, and g is equal to, it's also equal to alpha, because it's a steady state, right? And if you don't move too far from that zone, f minus g are going to be, f plus g is going to be equal to about two alpha. Right, so that part of the thing becomes constant. So this integral becomes something like minus, or let's just look at this piece. Right, that's what becomes equal to one over two alpha, right, times two minus integral of f minus g dx. Okay? And we already called this thing phi. Right, so this is exactly equal to phi of x over alpha. Right, so this thing, in fact, goes to e to the minus phi of x over alpha, okay, times some constant over two alpha. One constant, one more constant, doesn't make a difference, right? So you might as well just call that one over z. Okay, so this is very pretty. This is very pretty. So what I've shown is in a certain regime, in this case, a regime small enough that f plus g doesn't change much over the domain of integration, okay? The distribution of mRNA numbers, right, looks very much like a Boltzmann distribution sitting around a potential, and the potential is precisely given by f minus g minus integral of that, where well, this is the temperature. So now what you have to do is actually work out, you know, further implications of this, right? So let's, let's plug that in. So we already know what f and g are, right? So f, so integral minus of f minus g is integral of minus alpha minus gamma x dx, right? But, okay. And the answer to this is some alpha x minus let me draw the diagram. If that is f, and that is g, then what does phi look like? Phi looks like a parabolic well, right? Phi looks like a parabolic well. If I write, if I expand this thing around x star, right, then this thing is just gamma of x minus x star, or gamma of delta x, gamma of x minus x star because I can write, I can write alpha minus gamma x star plus delta x, which is alpha minus gamma alpha over gamma plus delta x, which is just minus gamma delta x. Okay. So in units of delta x, the value phi just looks like e to the minus gamma delta x squared. Phi is equal to gamma delta x squared, and this potential well looks like e to the minus gamma delta x squared. Okay? And you have an alpha on the bottom. And I'm just going to move that as alpha over gamma, and rewrite that as x star. Okay? Yes? The f plus g went because we're saying that around this point where much of the probability lies, both f and g are numerically equal to alpha. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Let me start again. Which, which bit? Here? Okay, so I'm just looking at this, 
Okay? I'm looking at that term, and I'm saying that by observation, f and g are both equal to alpha around this point. So I'm going to make that into 2 alpha. f minus g, so I, I take the 2 alpha out. Okay? Then I have minus 2 f minus g. Now this f minus g integral, the limits I haven't been specified, right? So I'm free to move the integral around. In particular, I'm free to integrate around the center point. I know what the center point is. The center point is alpha over gamma. So I define a new variable, which is delta x, which measures deviations from alpha over gamma. Okay? And I'm free to integrate using that delta x because it's just a linear transformation with no slope. Yeah? So in that, in those coordinates, the value of f minus g is just minus gamma delta x. Right? It's just saying that around this point, f minus g is just a negative line with slope gamma. And when I integrate that, I just get minus gamma delta x squared over 2, sorry. So phi is equal to minus gamma delta x squared over 2. It's just integral of delta x arbitrarily, okay? So when I plug everything in, when I plug everything in, this whole thing becomes e to the minus delta x squared over 2 alpha over gamma, right, times some, times some constant. The alpha came from f plus g, the factors of 2 cancelled out here, the factor of 2 came back when we integrated and therefore it's sitting over here. So look at this, what is this? This is a Gaussian distribution, this is a Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution has a mean of alpha over gamma. The Gaussian distribution has a variance of alpha over gamma. And you know what that distribution is. It's the Poisson distribution. Right? So this whole rigmarole actually comes back and says this thing exactly gives you the limit of the Poisson distribution, which is the, a Gaussian, with the correct mean and variance. Right? So this is quite nice. Okay. Question. Only around here. Around here, but the integration is not just around here. No, but the probabilities go very low for all other values. So in, in the range of integration, this is a very good approximation. And outside the range of integration, you don't even care. Okay? So in general, by the way, if f and g are not linear, okay, you can still say that maybe the stochastic distribution is quite tightly focused around some fixed point, you can linearize around there and do the same trick. And that's called the linear noise approximation. Okay? In this case, it's exactly linear. So you're right. Look, if I had solved this exactly, I would have got something that shapes more like a Poisson distribution. It would have had some skewness. It would have had some correction terms because of all that stuff. Right? Because the Poisson is sort of skewed to the, skewed to the right. Okay. Fine. Good. So what I want to say from all this is the following thing. We took this master equation approach, and from the master equation approach, we learned two things. We learned that for the simple mRNA creation and destruction problem, the solution is a Poisson distribution. Right? We also learned that the expectation value of the mRNA number obeys the traditional deterministic equation. We then got more ambitious, and we did the same thing for the Fokker-Planck equation, because this allowed us to solve things even when the coefficients were not linear in n. We did that, and we derived this very nice formula for the steady state distribution of an arbitrary chemical kinetic stochastic process in a single chemical variable. This trick will no longer work once I have x and y and z. Too bad. But for just x, it works quite nicely. Okay? And I derived it. Now, to check my derivation, I checked what it says about my favorite equation, the xdt is alpha minus gamma x. What do I get? I get exactly a Poisson distribution. I get the Gaussian limit of a Poisson distribution. It's kind of cool, right? So this whole thing is reasonably accurate. The homework problem that you, you, you're given, okay, I'm going to derive a certain form for f and g. You need to take that form. You need to plug it into this equation and plot what the curve looks like. And you need to normalize it. Then you need to run this kind of simulation. 
many, many, many times and see if you get the same histogram in steady state. Right? Then you need to run a Gillespie simulation many, many, many times and see if you get a Poisson and see if you get the correct steady state. So your homework involves just using the many different descriptions I've shown you okay, to work out how closely they approximate each other and you'll find that they're all pretty good. Yeah? And one last optional piece of the homework, optional, but very nice, is the following thing. Look at this situation. When the system is in a double well, when the system is in a double well, deterministically it's just sitting here, right? But stochastically, it's going to be bouncing around. And occasionally it can actually do this, right? So if you plot x as a function of time, it's going to be sitting around the low fixed point, and then occasionally it'll go up there. And then it'll come here. And then it'll go up there, come here, and so on. Yeah? And so by doing one of these, these simulations, or these simulations, you can actually work out the average time it takes for a heart cell to become a brain cell, right? Because this is really how cells maintain their state of gene expression. It's an auto-correcting loop, okay? So to tie a ribbon on this and finish it off in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to show you really how sigmoidal equations like this, okay, can arise in a real cell, okay? And I'm going to show you maybe a picture of how uh, how this will work. Okay. So here's the general intuition. In fact, I can even use this. Right? The picture is the following. You have a gene. And the gene, the product of the gene, is some sort of output. Previously, I was talking about that output as mRNA. But in this case, I'm going to say that the output is directly the protein. The gene becomes RNA, the RNA becomes protein, and the intervening processes we are going to ignore. It's not really legitimate to ignore them, but just for the purposes of argument, humor me. This X has two binding sites, A and B, in the promoter region of the gene. Okay, there's two binding sites. And it can bind to both those independently. Let's, let's see whether it's independent or not, right? So if you have a system which is just the promoter, and I'm going to call the promoter D for DNA, right? One molecule of X can bind to it to make DXA. That's if X occupies here. Another molecule of X can then bind to it to make DXA XB. That's if X occupies over here, right? And since these are stochastic processes and sort of reversible equilibrium reactions, there'll be some K plus and K minus, right? So K1 plus, K1 minus, K2 plus, K2 minus, right? And similarly, it could act the other way, right? It could bind to B and then it could bind to A, right? And this is K3 plus, K3 minus, K4 plus, K4 minus. So you might have seen something like this before, you might not have, but this is back in the world of traditional chemistry. You can think of this system as a large number of molecules, and there's a lot of copies of D, there's a lot of copies of X. A copy of X joins and makes DX, another copy of X joins and makes DXA, XB. A copy of X also leaves here, a copy of X also leaves here, and similarly here. I'm not going to draw all of them. So how do, you, how do you work out this? You need to make a few assumptions. Let's assume that the concentration of X is so high that the bound fraction of X is very small, right? So we're going to assume that the concentrations DXA, DXB, and DXA, XB are very much less than the total amount of X, right? Therefore, I'm free to use the total amount of X as, my, as a constant the system. And now, the way this development goes, I mean, this is the kind of thing you will see if you ever take a course on how gene expression is regulated and, and so on. I'm just trying to compress all that to motivate the homework problem. Okay. So we have the following equation. We have D plus X 
gives d x a k plus k minus right and the solution to that equation the right hand rate is the concentration of d times the concentration of x times k plus is equal to the concentration of d x a times k minus you've seen something like this before yeah stochastic chemical kinetics well sorry mass action chemical kinetics it's just a traditional thing um, and you'll have to draw you'll have to write down versions of the same thing for all the others right so generally what you'll then find is dxa is k plus over k minus d and i'm going to call k plus over k minus big k sub 1 okay this is the equilibrium binding constant and then you'll find dxb dxa xb is equal to k2 times k1 times d times x sorry sorry x times x squared and how did i get this dxa xb is just k plus times dxa times x k minus with these k minuses and k pluses so that's k2 right similarly you'll also find that dxb is equal to k3 times d times x and you'll find that dxa xb is equal to k4 times k3 times d times x squared these uh, square brackets mean concentrations that's how you do standard chemical kinetics okay uh, a few observations here since the same chemical species dxa xb has two different mathematical expressions one of which is k1 k2 dx the other which is k3 k4 dx squared yeah uh, k1 k2 must be equal to k3 k4 and this turns out to be simply the implementation of detailed balance for this thermodynamic system yeah, there's a whole other way to think about this which is just different states of a thermodynamic system and there are various energy levels associated with each of these the energy levels are the free energies and e to the minus free energy are related to these k's somehow so if you've ever done arrhenius theory that's where everything comes up okay fine so now we're going to take a certain limit right so we know that k1 k2 is equal to k3 k4 right so now let's assume that k1 is very much less than 1 or if k1 is very much less than k2 and k3 is very much less than k4 right in other words these k's are small so this reaction is highly in the left side these k's are large so the reaction is highly on the right side okay these k's are small these k's are large if you work out what this means you just write down all the terms and you keep track of one important variable which is the d total must be equal to d plus d x a plus d x b plus d x a x b okay if you, if you do that these conditions mean that these things are very small if i divide this by d total well, it means that these terms are very much less than the total right and it's easy to imagine why so the system is in this state initially it's highly unlikely for the first molecule of x to bind it's highly unlikely but as soon as that molecule x binds it's highly likely another molecule of x binds and this is a thing called cooperativity in protein binding it means that the binding of the first molecule has somehow changed the conformation changed the internal state of the second binding site and made it much more likely for another copy of x to bind okay it's called cooperativity and it's a very common feature of how these promoters work yeah all that to say that these terms can be neglected yeah so then you find that d total is just d plus dxa xb we already know the formula for dxa xb right so we find that d total is equal to d plus k1 k2 x squared d right and this is equal to d uh, 1 plus k1 k2 x squared okay so if you want to plot if you want to just write down what the total amount of 
so therefore d is equal to d total over 1 plus k 1 k 2 x squared and d x a x b is equal to d total times k 1 k 2 x squared over 1 plus k 1 k 2 x squared. Okay. So, fine. So, what do we have? We have a formula. How much time do I have? Five minutes. We have a formula for as a function of the free amount of x, as a function of the free amount of x, how much of the system is in this state? And for low values of x, the system is mainly in this state because the x is in the bottom, right? And for high values of x, the system is basically in this state. Yeah? Now I'm going to make one final step, okay? I'm going to say that if you're in state D, right, you're going to create RNA with some rate nu sub 1. And if you're in rate state D, X, A, X, B, you're going to create RNA with some rate nu sub 2. Okay. I'm also going to assume that the volumes and so on all get, the, you know, this is a concentration, so there's a volume involved. So I'm going to make a change of variables to the same variables that we're using all class, where I'm talking about molecule numbers in a fixed volume. This basically just amounts to changing the numerical values of K1 and K2. Therefore, the rate of synthesis of whatever thing is being made here, which happens to be X, is equal to nu1 plus nu2 K1 K2 X squared over 1 plus K1 K2 X squared, right? So you're synthesizing both from here, which is that term, and from here, which is that term. But the more x you have already, the more likely you're going to be in this state. And your standard decay term. And if you plot that, it looks precisely like this. Right? This is f, this is g. Okay. So what I've, this whole thing is just to say that uh, in a real genetic system, there are very many systems that behave exactly like this. In fact, cells are designed to behave like this. They're designed to set up the rates of synthesis and decay of some protein so that it creates a double well potential. And the double well potential, if the wells are sufficiently deep, then once you stick a cell in a well, it's going to stay there for a long time. However, because of the limit of low molecule numbers and there is noise, you will occasionally transition from one well to another which essentially amounts to a cell type changing, right? In our bodies, those kinds of things don't happen at all. But for bacterial cells, those kinds of changes do happen. So you can probably keep a cell in a well for tens of cell lifetimes, but eventually it'll flip out okay, because of that. And I'll show you on uh, tomorrow afternoon some experimental data that supports this kind of picture, okay? So there we go. I've told you a few things. So we're going to grade 50% uh, on one problem in the homework, which is problem four. Problem four involves taking this equation, plugging in certain values of the parameters that I've told you to plug in, then simply plotting this as a curve and correctly normalizing it, and doing simulations using this and using this, right, to the best of your ability, and checking to what extent all these different ways of predicting the state of the system agree. That's the homework. That homework counts for 50%. Then, in the exam, the exam has a few bits. The first bit is just using random number generators to generate other random numbers, just like your prob first problem in the homework. Another question in the exam involves taking, just like I had done, I've erased it, the master equation, and trying to calculate an equation for one of the moments. We calculated an equation for m. I wanted to calculate an equation for m squared. That's all. Right. So you just have to go through the same steps that I told you here. Okay. Fine. Thanks. I'll see you at the tutorial. Have you, has everybody signed the sheet? No?